Okay, continuing on with our theme of conservation successes and evidence that we can uh, conserve things, save things when we put our mind and resources to it. Um, next, we're going to talk about condors, California condors. So um, real quick, our outline today is going to be, um, as, as with many of the organisms we've talked about um, in our course, uh, they start off really abundant. Um, and then with the European era, things begin to change. And then particularly in the last 100 years or so, things change uh, even more rapidly. These guys are a key scavenger, and we lose them, um, lose that role uh, as they disappear. Um, they, the main conservation challenges for this species outright habitat destruction, um, changing prey base, uh, poisoning, um, and then active shooting. That's not technically hunting, because people don't really eat them, but, but it's, it's targeted killing. And all that uh, comes together to drive the population down. They become the, uh, probably the conservation poster child. Um, uh, and, and that's based right here in Ventura County, so you guys should all know about them. Ground, Ventura County's ground zero for the recovery of this species. Um, and in doing that, we'll talk about this today, in doing that, in doing that conservation, we had to invent some new science and some new cultural approaches to doing conservation, et cetera. Um, and overall, these guys are a conservation success. You should be proud of, of the work that um, our, our colleagues and collaborators have done on this. And then we'll just end with some of the existing, re remaining hurdles, existing hurdles. So here's a little, we'll start with this little video here. So this is from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service from a few years ago. This is in the wake of the Thomas Fire, right? And at the time of the Thomas Fire, that was the largest wildfire in California state history. Um, and condors uh, exist in this area where the, where the Thomas Fire uh, burned. And so in particular, we had this one nest that, that uh, had a, a baby in it at the time or an egg at the time, and people were really worried about it. So this is just a little video. Um, so this is a, a shot of the mom. Walk around looking at her egg right there. Um, uh, this was before this was before the fire, and so people were really worried. Uh, we most of these birds now they're so rare we have them uh, tagged and and many of them radio collared. Not all, but many of them. So this particular bird, uh, the the parent bird, you know, was collared, and so we had evidence that that she was around. And then right after the fire, she also was sort of hanging out around. Um, but then the fire came, and we weren't sure. Uh, what was going on. So people had to head up there. And, uh, and many of our alums work for the program that facilitates, facilitates these guys, either Hopper Mountain itself or, or uh, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service Office or other groups. And so uh, we were heavily involved. Uh, our alumni are heavily involved with this, these efforts. And so these guys hiked on up. They found the, the nest location, which is up on a craggy hillside, um, typically. And uh, they, they said, they first found both the birds, and so like, hey, this is great. And then, um, and they eventually found the, the chick. Love the generic inspirational music. It's like you're waiting on hold the doctor's office. So this is, you can tell this is an immature individual because he's got a black head, right? Adults will have bald pink heads. Uh, th at the time of this video, she hadn't been flying yet. Now, now the bird is, you know, fine and doing everything. So fledging is where a bird goes from just walking around to actually flying away from the nest r routinely and, and maybe even not coming back to the nest. So you see her, her um, wingtips there are a little bit singed. They should be a little bit longer here. It should be a little bit out here, but she was okay. So, uh, so that's, a, that, that's a nice success story. Okay, so let's talk about condors. So um, this is um, a species that is in its own genus. So it's only one species in its genus. Um, 
uh, typically recognized by the classic vulture bald head, so this sort of pink head that you can see from far away, uh, different, uh, very different from, from its black uh, feathers on the rest of its body. Adults are um, pretty big, so a full-grown adult with a full-blown wingspan will be about 10 feet or so wide, long. And if you guys have not seen a, a condor, where have you been? You need to go to the library because we have a, a, a mounted individual that passed away um, up there in a, a essentially permanent loan. Um, and you can both see that how big the bird, that, that one's not a totally full grown one, it was a, it was a juvenile, but it's, it still gives you a sense of how big they can get. And it also has um, some of the wing tags and, and the a transmitter so you can get a sense of, of how, what those guys look like. Um, these individuals breed in places like Ventura County, in coastal California, with these very uh, steep cliffs, typically. Um, where they, we don't have steep cliffs, they'll be in something really tall, like a redwood tree or something of that nature, so they, they are off the ground. They do not nest on the ground, they do not nest low towards the ground. Um, also really important to their conservation and management, they have a nest, but they also have what are called roosts. So a roost is, is where a bird will perch and usually look over a large vista. In this case, these individuals are scavengers, so they're looking for dead things. So they're looking for signals of other, other birds, you know, accumulating in an area or whatever. So they want to have a roost, generally speaking, that has a really broad field of view around the, the area. So they can, you know, sort of keep their eye out for something that looks maybe, maybe food-like. <clears throat> um, uh, and I would say that to, this is an important consideration for these types of uh, animals that have particularly important behaviors that are associated with specific geographies. So some bird, uh, some fish, excuse me, um, spawn over pinnacles or little little rock mountaintop type things. Um, things like these condors, roosts are important. So even though these roosts are spatially very, very small and not a large area, we need to make sure they're conserved. Because if we don't, if we have a large area but we don't have good roosts, everything else might fall. So a, a key example of, a, of a, a central part of their habitat that we have to make sure is in place when we establish, uh, say, a protected area for them or something of that nature. Um, okay, uh, in December, uh, mom lays an egg and takes about two months to hatch. So we're just sort of out of the hatching season right now. Unlike uh, many birds, there's a high degree of parental investment here. So not just, not the moms don't, or the moms and dads just don't feed the bird for a little bit, they feed the bird for an extended period of time. So they hang out in the nest, they never come out of the nest for at least about six, well, maybe a little bit less than six months, right? So many months. And so that whole time, mom and dad are bringing food uh, back to the, uh, to the baby. Uh, then a fledgling where they're, they're you know, kind of, okay, I can start to go out on my own and do that kind of stuff. Um, these birds, and this is, this is going to be key when we get to the recovery, um, they don't have a bird every year. So because of this, because, you know, lay an egg, and then it's, you know, six months-ish or so of feeding and everything, it takes a lot out of these birds. And so they don't typically have a baby every single year. So the max we typically see in the wild, the max, not the normal, but the max is two individuals, or two, two, two babies, two eggs laid every three years. So it's, it's common for them to skip a year in terms of, repro in terms of reproduction. Uh, it takes them about uh, at least six years to reach sexual maturity, sometimes a bit more. Um, and they are a long-lived critter. Right, so we're talking decades and decades. They're about as old as, as humans essentially live. So um, uh, you know, you should be now sensing from all of our previous discussions that oh my gosh, slow growing, don't have a bunch of babies every year, uh, that kind of stuff. This is an organism that's a particularly vulnerable to um, maybe some management um, problems, right? Or, or if we don't, if we're, if we're not careful, we can quickly get into a problem state with these individuals. Um, their territories, uh, the historic territories can be quite large. It's going to depend on the prey base. So where there's not much food, it's a much larger territory they roam over. Where there's lots of abundant food around, they, they can get by with smaller uh, territories. Um, yeah, okay. 
Uh, they fly a lot. So they do a lot of these, this gliding of the, the, these classic vultures will do. So, um, so they will uh, not typically flap their wings, but they'll oftentimes ride thermals. So they'll essentially like a, like a hang glider. So they'll be, they'll be flying, but they're not necessarily actively you know, banging their wings every, every minute of the time that they're in the air. Um, and again, they feed on dead things. So they feed on uh, dead deer, uh, dead marine mammals, uh, dead uh, cattle, that kind of stuff. Um, and and there's, there's still research going on uh, to fully understand how they locate stuff, but they definitely use visual as well as smell, but they seem to use visual um, a lot. Um, so they're, they're looking for things from far, far away because that smell, while, while these scavenger critters in general tend to be good sniffers, good smellers of, of funky odors. Um, these individuals really do seem to, because they go over such a large area, they rely on vision uh, or, or obvious uh, signals of an animal in distress or that, or that an animal died, um, uh, perhaps more so than other individuals. Um, they're monogamous and they're not sexually dimorphic, so it's hard, just looking at them, you can't tell if that's a male or a female, right? You have to, you have to get, get in close. Um, so a little cartoon here, so uh, uh, this is supposed to be funny, you guys didn't laugh, okay, whatever, it's fine, okay. All right, so, so this is uh, how we can tell um, what our condors look like. So we typically see them in flight, so we're typically looking up at them, underneath them, look at them, but their belly. And first and foremost, our condors have, um, a, a, well, they're very big, but again, when they're in the air, it's hard to get the scale. But, but they're our largest bird around here. So if, if you happen to have some kind of sense of scale, you can totally confirm that that's a California condor. Um, but if it's up in the air, don't know. So if we first look for these white patches, these white patches underneath the, the wings, um, and, and in an adult, they're going to be very distinct and white, um, as opposed to the juveniles will, will start um, dark, and then they'll, they'll, that white will sort of fill in as we go. Um, and, and they're distinct from the, our turkey vultures as well. They are totally iconic. So um, I can't express how iconic these individuals are. So um, this is, uh, this is uh, right here, this is Miss Condor from Condor Field, right? So, so our, our uh, uh, drone um, field right here is called the Condors, the, the, the radio controlled airplane club that that originally established that. They call themselves the condors. Here's a baby condor that you can buy in, in Santa Barbara Zoo and places like that. Above that is the Chumash uh, rock art, famous Chumash rock art, uh, uh, known for their cave paintings and stuff around the world. And this is a classic depiction of a condor. Condor very important to the native peoples uh, that were here. Um, and not just here, but up and down the west coast. So then we have a totem the top of a totem pole right there from the Pacific Northwest that also is representing a condor. Um, we in our, in our uh, current society also love them, so, so we've put them on postage stamps. Um, and then the California quarter. So a few years ago, you guys are so young, you don't remember this, but a few years ago there, there was just one type of quarter for the U.S. And then we started a, the U.S. Mint started a project to try to create um, more uniqueness and, and interest in, in coins. And so they started making one coin for each of the 50 states. And what happened when we did that was every state got to vote. So there were, there were options, there, there were versions. And so we had, uh, so a lot of people nominated, then we had sort of a first round of voting, and then we had the final round of voting. In the final round of voting, um, people said, hey, what's iconic about California? So when we came down to the voting, it was, there was a Golden Gate Bridge and sort of San Francisco and the trolley cars and that kind of stuff, which a lot of people liked. There was the Hollywood sign and the beaches of Southern California. That was, and people in sunglasses, that was super iconic. And then this one here, which was Yosemite, John Muir, and a condor. And this one won. So this is our state coin. So all those things are cool, all those things are popular, but even in, in you know, urban Los Angeles, this coin, this depiction of California um, was chosen as, as the representation. So, so people, um, uh, really appreciate condors. They're a great thing here. You see a little uh, example of some uh, kids in a grade school. Well, we have a felt cutout 
of an adult condor. So that, that's, that's life size. And so they roll it out and they're like, wow, it's so big, right? So very, very iconic individual. Um, this is what one looks like, if you can see one. Again, you know, you know now this is a juvenile, right? How do we know it's a juvenile? Blackhead. Blackhead, right, good, yeah. And so, um, and, and most of our vultures are not, are not tagged in radio collar. So, these, so this individual both has a, a you know, satellite tag on its wing and a number here. So the number is both important and the color of the number. So the background and then the, the, the foreground lettering. And it's all, they're all codes. So if we look at them from far away and we just see the, just see the, the wing band, we can all tell, oh, okay, that's the, it's that individual. Izzy. Does the juvenile have feathers on their head or is the skin just black? Uh, they, they, have a, they have some feathers initially that come off, but, but they also have skin that's black. So around the face is also skin, and it's just black. Okay, here's one of those iconic roosts. So here's, you can see these young individuals hanging out on a classic roost, which, roost, which in this case is like a, rid, a, a razorback on a, on a ridge type of thing. And then here's some um, uh, of uh, my pictures. And so this is at the Grand Canyon, um, which, is, which we'll talk about is one of our uh, established populations. But these are these birds. The Grand Canyon is particularly great because they love to fly down in the canyon. And so you can be above them and take pictures. A lot of times here in Ventura and places like that, we're kind of taking pictures up at them. So the Grand Canyon is a very photogenic place to take pictures of condor. Uh, not only are they in uh, now, not only are they in places like the Grand Canyon, they're also um, you know, here on, in coastal California. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, they're carrion feeders. So the reason they don't have feathers on their head evolutionarily is so when they stick their head in a rotten, dead thing, they're not going to have rotten, dead flesh sticking on their head. So you can imagine that would be an infection risk or, or you know, a sanitation risk over time. So that's, that's why their head is bald. Um, uh, until we started the restoration, we didn't actually know this, but one of the cool things we discovered um, uh, when we returned them, particularly to the, the Big Sur coast area, was that they actually feed on marine mammals. And we now think that marine mammals, you know, dead marine mammals, elephant seals, things like that, um, were quite possibly a very important part of their diet for our coastal, uh, immediate coastal zone um, critters. Okay, so this is what happened to them. So we have, we know that they've been in the fossil record here in, in California, in the West Coast, for at least 100,000 years. Uh, the best record of them is in our La Brea tar pits uh, uh, collections that we've talked about previously. Um, and they are found alongside Tetratornis, which was even a bigger, which, was, which is even about 25% larger uh, uh, scavenger uh, vulture. That, that species is extinct now. Um, uh, during the Pleistocene, they were pretty much across the huge swath of the US, all the way to New York. Um, and then, about 10,000 to 11,000 years ago, they, they rapidly disappeared over much of that range. So any guesses or any, any suspicions as to what might have driven that? Uh, less megafauna, less species. Yeah, so, so it, it's, it's doubtful that the early humans that were coming into North America were hunting vultures. They, they could have been or probably much more likely they were just hunting the things they were hunting, and so the prey base of condors started to crash, right? Started to change. And so that's, that's, mo that's the best explanation as to why we start to see their distribution change uh, 10,000 odd years ago. By the 1500s, when we first started get, getting some of these European uh, uh, you know, explorers and things like that coming through and making records, um, they're pretty much restricted to just the Pacific Coast, which means British Columbia to Baja, down, down into Mexico. Um, uh, by the 1700s, they actually do a little bit of a bounce back, not all the way to New York or anything like that, but they do a little bit of bounce back, likely because we brought in so much cattle, so many cattle. And so those cattle die, and now there's larger, more discrete food sources. And, and that can support uh, larger uh, condor populations. Uh, by the 1800s, they're, again, Columbia River to Baja. Um, by the mid-1800s, they drop out of Washington and Oregon. By the 1940s, they drop out of Mexico. 
And then by the 1980s, all the condors, California condors left in the world are here and in Santa Barbara. So we are the epicenter of the remnant population. This is what that looks like. So here we go. So the light green here, I have the, their historic range map. Um, so this was, this was you know, 10,000 years or so ago, something like that. Um, 2,000 years ago, they've, they've, they've dropped a bit. Um, 1800s, uh, th we, they're restricted to the um, uh, immediate coast. And uh, we know that they were at least to the Columbia River because this is uh, Lewis and Clark, the famous Lewis and Clark expedition. Uh, Clark wrote in his journal, Reuben Fields killed a buzzard of the large kind, measured from the tip of the wings across nine and a half feet. No other bird is nine and a half feet. Uh, there's no other buzzard, quote unquote, that's nine and a half feet long. And then he actually sketched it out in his journal. So we know that um, in 1805, condors existed at the, Columbia, at the mouth of the Columbia River. Okay, uh, then we have all the stuff that comes into play. We have habitat destruction. We're, we're um, uh, you know, uh, a lot of, DDT, these, these individuals suffer a lot from DDT poisoning, et cetera. Their numbers are dwindling, dwindling, dwindling. And so by the late 70s, by, by, the, by the early 70s, we're getting worried. By late 70s, this is the remnant distribution. And I always, I, I have, I'll show you the answer, but for a few years, I was always wondering why, so this map is always reproduced in the story of the condor. And so this is, when we started getting serious about the conservation, this was like, this is the range. And, and they, they only existed in the red splotches, right? So that's where we know they were, uh, in this case, in 1979. But, but the range is depicted as this, as this horseshoe. And I was always like, why is it? Why is that? And this is the answer. The answer is because uh, this was, uh, if those of you who have taken GIS, this is basically an early version of Krieging. This is an early version of fitting the distribution. So even though their main concentrations are down here where we have these, these concentrated dots, which are an observation, we did have occasional observations of them up around, over in here, et cetera. And so that's why these guys drew this initial sort of horseshoe map, even though their populations were mostly just in Santa Barbara and uh, the nesting populations just in Santa Barbara and Ventura counties. Okay, so this is what the numbers were looking like. Um, by the time we get around to our first quantitative studies, the first quantitative measurements of condors, which is 1939, um, the population is already super, super small. So it's on the order of the estimate, the estimation in 1939 was somewhere between 60 and 100 birds. Um, by 1967, so these individuals are listed, and we, we, we haven't t gone into extreme detail. We mostly talk about the 1973 Federal Endangered Species Act, but we did have some preliminary, um, so, some previous versions of, of um, endangered species management, and uh, that, that uh, and condors were on that, that iconic first listing. And so in 1967, their first uh, uh, recognized as something that's in danger that we need to do something about. At that point, there's something like 50 to 60 estimated individuals around. We have this conference in 1975 with all these bird experts and everybody coming together to try to figure out what's going on with the condor. And the estimates at that conference uh, at that time are something like 25 to 35 individuals left in the whole world. By 1982, the wild population was down to 21 individuals. Um, 1985, down to nine. On April 19th, so we just passed the anniversary of this, on April 19th, 1987, um, uh, the, when I was 16, the last wild condor was captured and the species went extinct in the wild. So we brought the last individual into captivity. Um, and then the next year, we had our first successful uh, birds in captivity actually lay an egg that survived. And so that was a huge thing. And that was done at the San Diego Zoo. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, we'll talk about how the, the, we need to talk about that, those important steps, how we got that to happen, and then the next steps. But let me first uh, step back and talk about the management of condors historically over the, the early part of the 1900s. Um, uh, in 1908, a uh, guy in LA County shot a condor and was given a fine of $50. So that's the first evidence that we have of someone actually um, uh, getting a penalty for, for, for interfering or, or impacting this particular species. 
Um, we know they were in Arizona up until 1924. How do we know that? Just like, unfortunately, like our grizzly bear and these other iconic critters, because the last dude shot it. And so we, we, it was recorded that that guy killed a condor, and we, haven't see, we did not see a condor since uh, up until the, um, we started our current, our current era of recovery. Um, in 1937, we established the first protected area to try to help the recovery of the species, right? To give it a little bit of, a little bit of breathing space, that kind of stuff. It's very small. It's only 486 hectares. It's not enough, but it's it's nevertheless it is something that is a tangible step of of trying to um, uh, help the recovery of this species. As I mentioned before, that 1939 study was the first real rigorous scientific assessment, and in that study, already by 1939, they say the problem is people are shooting these birds. Uh, people are actively, intentionally poisoning them to death. And, and that the loss of uh, forage habitat and et cetera is also, all those things are combining to drive them down. Um, why do you think people might want to shoot these individuals? What's that? Uh, they could be trophies, although they're, so yeah, th th that's a possible explanation. But um, that wasn't the main reason why people were shooting them like crazy in the 1910s and 20s and stuff. Probably a pest. I mean, they're massive. So they're yes. So just like we shot the bears, just like we shot the mountain lions, just like we shot the wolves, these were considered something that went against what we wanted to do. So a lot of, a lot of you know, so your cattle might die. Maybe they're dead on the ground. And then, um, and then the uh, you know farmer comes out, and there's a condor feeding on it, right? And so there's either this, this association, either out of frustration, or this ignorance, thinking that the condor may be killed or contributed to the death of the cattle. So I don't want those things. I'm going to shoot it, right? So I'm gonna, I, I don't want condors around because I want to have healthy cattle. Ironically, the condors help with the health, right, by, by breaking down all that rotten meat and all that kind of stuff and consuming it. But nevertheless, um, uh, that's what was going on. Uh, by 1947, we expand that initial sanctuary. Um, uh, and uh, I should say all, all, this, all these sanctuaries we're talking about are in um, up behind Ojai, basically, right? So they're in the, what we now call the Los Padres Wilderness. Um, and so, uh, so, so, so we expanded a lot within 10 years, right? Two orders of magnitude expansion. That, so that, that's a real recognition that we got to do something here. I should also say that um, we haven't touched on it a whole lot, um, but this idea of an umbrella species, right? We've talked about that a little bit with regards to our mountain lions, but this idea of one species that if we take steps to help recover that, that individual, um, hopefully it'll help that individual species, but also have benefits to the rest of the community. And that's the idea here. So even, even if these, these sanctuaries didn't um, initially immediately help the recovery of the condor, they certainly helped the conservation of other, uh, you know, organisms, other biodiversity, other ecosystem functioning, et cetera. Okay, so then we move on to the, the next 20 years. The next 20 years, we continue to expand that protected area. In 1952, really early, the San Diego Zoo says, hey, maybe we should try breeding these, excuse me, breeding these birds in captivity, in, the, in our zoo setting to help uh, uh, augment them. And so they, they um, base this on what was already happening with, with Andean condors. Andean condors, different genus. We only have six species of, of New World vultures. So in the, in the Americas, there's only six species of vultures. So we don't have, we don't have hundreds and hundreds of species. So while this, the genus, the Andean condor and our California condor are not the same genus, they're very similar ecologically. They serve the, serve the same roles, they're about the same size, they're, they live in the same kind of areas, that type of stuff. And so, um, and the Andean condors were doing okay. So rather than experiment with our rare birds, we got an analog, we got a model critter, and we tried, tried messing with them, and basically we were able to figure out, ah, we can get these guys to breed and a key innovation was this so-called double clutching. So a clutch is, a, is a, a lay of eggs, right? And so it turns out, what we figured out is, as I mentioned before, right, the maximum out in the wild is two eggs for how many years? 
three years, right? So, so that's, that, that's, you know, it'll, it's better than nothing, but it's going to take a while. What they figured out is an evolutionarily um, selected for behavior is, because these guys live up on cliffs, right? Up on cliffs, mountain ledges, that kind of stuff. What if one day you're like, dope, and you actually bump your egg, and the egg goes off the cliff? Screwed, right? You have to wait a whole other year before you could try having another egg. Um, and, and if it happens late in the season, that absolutely happens. But it turns out if it happens very, very early after you've laid the egg, the female will go back into estrus and can lay another egg. And so what they did was when the, when the mom would lay an egg, you know, have a fertilized egg laid there, they would go in at night and grab it, take it away, and put it in an incubator. And then mom would lay another egg. And so that was a way to double the production of babies, um, a, key a key innovation. Okay, so because they had that, um, they said, okay, now we think we can do this. So can we get permits to go out and get to a, a male and a female from the wild, now we're talking California condors, and bring them into the San Diego Zoo so if we can try to do this ourselves. And the Audubon Society was like, no effing way. There's, 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 a, you know, there's dozens of these birds left and you want to start experimenting with them? No. And so, so this is the first of a lot of protests and a lot of controversy, right? So we don't know the right path forward. We don't have any experience doing this yet. And so we can't point to some, some model of how we think it's gonna work or our success rate or whatever. And so that stalls us. The first legal protections come in in 1953, where our uh, fish and game, which we, you guys all know now, we now refer to as California Fish and Wildlife, but at the time it was called California Fish and Game. Uh, agency um, says it's, in it's unlawful to take condor at any time or in any manner, right? So across the whole state of California. So that, that um, is, again, trying to help the situation, um, but it doesn't do a whole, whole lot. By 1965, we have the first dedicated federal monies to just, for staff, to just focus on condors. So you can imagine, you guys are studying for this class, studying for your other class, so you got a lot of stuff going on, it's hard to focus on this class, hard to focus on your other class. It's important that we have people that can focus just on these particular conservation challenges and not be distracted by other things, and so that happens. Unfortunately, this is back in Maryland, is where, is where the staff are, so that's not ideal, but at least we have some people starting to you know, think about it, go through the literature, that kind of stuff. As I mentioned before, um, the predecessor of the Native Species Act lists these guys in 1967. Um, and uh, we basically um, have one bird that was kind of wounded. We tried to nurse it back to health, didn't get back, didn't, didn't recover, and so we end up putting that in the zoo in, in LA. So now we have some uh, you know, captive individual uh, in a zoo setting. Um, we pass, uh, California passes our own Endangered Species Act, and it gets listed, and the condor are listed in 71. Uh, 1975, Hopper Mountain National Wildlife Refuge is established, and this is on the edge of the Sespe Condor Sanctuary. And this becomes super important because there's some really important roosts, and then Hopper Mountain will become the epicenter of the restoration of the species. So it's a, Hopper Mountain itself is a little small, but um, it's really great. So I used to take you guys up to there, but um, the ornithology class for many years started started taking students up there, so I, 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 I don't. But, um, but if, you guys, if you guys haven't been, you guys should definitely go check it out. It's a, it's a cool place. Um, okay, 1975, California puts together our condor recovery team and starts working on a plan. We, ha we designate critical areas, which is a part of the Endangered Species Act, right? When something's super small, we gotta figure out a plan. We gotta figure out the, the core area of it. We do that. Um, and then we have a conference in 1979, and nobody can decide what they want to do. So the enviros have some opinions, the academics have some opinions, the agency folks have some opinions, the Chumash people have some opinions, and we cannot, we do not come together. People, people do not get on the same page. Um, and the only thing we can agree to is that we should really, really do a lot of monitoring. So we should really get a better number of how many there are. But that's all, we, that's all the folks can, can um, agree to. 
In the wake of this, uh, Congress then, if, uh, U.S. Congress, uh, comes together and says, um, hey, we need to, this, is, this critter is going away fast. You guys can't seem to get your act together. We need to expedite this plan, and we need to really fund some active field research. And so we, we do a lot more um, field stuff after there. Um, uh, the, that bird research center in 1980 becomes this condor research center. So the whole center is focused on condors. Um, and uh, the California Department of Fish and Game, again, now we call it California Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, in 1980 starts a long-term um, research plan. And part of that is going to be to capture individuals, breed them, doing telemetry, all that kind of stuff. And so we go, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna do it, man. We just, we're just gonna start doing it. We don't care if everybody's not in agreement. We're just gonna start capturing birds. And they, um, they go up and they're monitoring, because we don't, we don't know how to do this. We haven't worked with these large birds, like the, these large vultures on the sides of cliffs before. So they go up and they're handling this one little baby and they screw up and the bird dies, the chick dies. And then everybody gets in an uproar, right? And so then the permits to go grab them from the wild get yanked. Like, nope, can't do that. You guys are going to kill the birds. You need to do better. Um, so there's some retooling. There's some retooling that goes on. And uh, uh, the, the proposal is, hey, maybe we'll have these folks that work with birds as opposed to agency folks, maybe people that work with birds, more, more animal husbandry type folks, maybe have those guys go try to capture the birds. And that's what happens. And uh, they're allowed to capture up to three condors over a period of three years. Um, and we do that. And then in the wake of that, these birds come back. And that's when we get the first chick born in captivity, 1982. Um, uh, we then start to see uh, the first documented case, which will become a big theme here in a second, documented case of one of these birds dying of lead poisoning. Um, and, and now people are worried. So the population is already dwindling, and now we're starting to see these birds dying from, from um, acute lead poisoning. So we don't have any more time to waste. We might not know how to do, capture every single one safely, but if we don't capture them now and start breeding, they're all going to be dead soon. And so, uh, so we start this, this project. The Chumash really don't like that. This is a sacred animal to them, and they're like, you're going to go and capture the last of this sacred critter from our territory and our, our, our traditional lands, screw you. And so there's a big uh, protest. And long story short, there's a, there's a lot of debate and, and harsh words and everything. The compromise is that we'll, the scientists will be allowed to go capture the birds from the wild, but they will go with the tribal representative. And the tribal representative is going to do some blessings. And, and oversee stuff and make sure that stuff is done respectfully and all that kind of good stuff. And so now we're on the same page. So people are, are now, now coming together, not like that previous conference I mentioned in the 70s where everybody was just like rrr, rrr, at each other's throat. And then April 19th, 1987, the last wild bird is captured and the species goes extinct in the wild. And we have a total of 27 individuals at that point. Okay, so then we start this captive breeding program. The captive breeding program is pretty iconic and has been now used with many other species, but a lot of it was developed with, for the California condors. And so this is the basic idea. Oh, sorry, I'm going pretty fast. Uh, questions? Any questions about that, that management history so far? Makes sense? Yeah, Brian. So you said that if an animal goes extinct, can you, I guess, like can you just get the tree out and can't go back into it? Uh, great question. Um, so they're already, so at, at this point, at the point that they go, if you remember back to our definitions of extinction, uh, at this point when we pull them out of the wild, Ecologically, they're probably already functionally extinct because there were so few of them. They weren't having a major impact. So turkey vultures probably took over their role um, uh, as far as scavengers. And then to a lesser extent, crows and ravens probably took over that role um, uh, of, of like dead cows and you know, consuming dead cows and goats and things like that. Good question. Okay, uh, so this is what we do. So we have some birds in captivity. We're very, very worried about imprinting. Somebody tell me what imprinting is? Right. It's like when I sit down on my couch and my rabbit comes over and says, like, I want to snuggle with you kind of thing, right? That's fine for my rabbit. Um, if, if, that, if my rabbit was out in the wild, I don't, know if I'm want, I don't know if I want him to run up to some person, might run on a road and get smushed by a car or something, right? So, so domestic animal imprinting is fine. 
wild animals were kind of worried about that. In particular with these individuals, since people shoot them, people poison them, right? All that kind of stuff. So we're maybe a little bit worried. We don't want them coming to people. We want them to be a little spooked, it's like stay away from people, right? So in the breeding process, the birds that are in there, they never see a person. So um, what we have going on here is, so remember we double clutch, right? So mom feeds a bird, but if we double clutch, they, they can only feed one bird at a time. So by definition, we're gonna have some extra, I mean, initially we don't, we don't have, when not everybody's laying an egg, you're fine. But after the first couple years, when all the moms, you know, or, or all, all the, the pairs have babies, you're gonna run out of moms to feed them. So we feed them with these puppets. So this thing up here is a, is a um, hand puppet. And so, so the, per, the human is behind that blue, that blue wall and they are very, very careful to always hide themselves, right? And so they're, they're feeding the baby chick just like mom would feed them, right? So the mom's gonna eat food, then regurgitate it, and then feed it to the baby. And so, so that's all good, so they don't see it. Then, once, once we have the babies, and so they're born in captivity, and they get to, you know, decent size, then we need to make sure they know how to hunt and that they're used to their wild environment. So then we take them and we bring them to these other areas. So we take them to places like this, right? At Hopper Mountain and these other, and these other areas where essentially they're, they're outdoors, right? So they're beginning to, so right now they can't, so in this case, can't fly everywhere, but can fly in this little area. So they're starting to get a sense of flying, moving around, that kind of stuff. We can then put carcasses, you know, dead, dead baby goats and things like that in there. They can start <laughs> eating. And then essentially over time, we're gonna give them a little bit more and more exposure, a little bit more exposure, opening the gate, and then eventually letting them go, kind of thing. So, um, we, in 1988, we had that first successful breeding captivity. Um, initially, in 88, we're using Andy and condors as the surrogates to, to nurse the eggs, to, to, to care for the chicks and stuff, um, those double clutching. Um, and uh, 1992, we released the first two California and Andean condors in the CESPI. So in other words, we take some birds from South America, let them go here in Ventura County, because we're trying to figure it out. Again, we're trying to work through the project, project with not the endangered species. Um, and then uh, two men shoot at one of them, right? So we're like, oh man, right? We just spent all this time, we just recovered these guys, and these jackasses are trying to kill them, right? So um, those guys got fines, and two months in prison, and people are like, whoa, why are we in prison for just shooting a bird, a buzzard, right? But, but nevertheless, that was an important signal. Then, one of the other birds dies of drinking um, coolant, you know, car coolant, antifreeze, right? Um, uh, antifreeze is commonly put out as poison for our coyotes and stuff. It tastes a little sweet. It, 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 when you first put it on your tongue, it, it has a little bit of a sugary taste. And so critters will lap it up and then they'll um, poison themselves. So it's unclear if somebody intentionally was trying to poison this bird or just trying to poison other things, but regardless, poisoning killed this, uh, this other bird. So we keep persisting, uh, expanding it, and um, we start to expand the program to uh, Santa Barbara uh, and to, uh, to releases in Santa Barbara County and to um, uh, some, some um, Animal husbandry, some rearing at uh, a facility in Idaho, the Peregrine Fund facility in Idaho, um, and uh, we expand the. We exp so basically, the next couple years are, are are expanding, right? So now we're starting to figure it out. We know how to do it. Now we want to start to increase our capacity. So start expanding. We, importantly, in 1996, we have the experimental population designation, which we'll come back to and talk talk about in a sec, which is very very key. Uh, this is under the Endangered Species Act and we de declare Arizona, Utah, and Nevada an experimental population of these birds. And I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Um, and then that allows us to, in 1996, start releasing birds in Arizona in and around the Grand Canyon, which is already a massive national park, so we know that we have some good protected area there. Um, and then the next year in Big Sur and the Ventana Wilderness, and then um, uh, again, and the same thing happens in Arizona, one of the first birds gets shot, and a guy gets one year probation, has to do two hours of community service, and is charged $3,200, which should have been a lot more in my opinion, but regardless, it was considered a large, a large sum, a, a, lar a large fine for Arizona. Um, and then, super, super important for, for us, 
the public doesn't really pay attention to this stuff. But in 1999, we had Y-130, which is this one, um, one bird who was in Lion, that should be Lion Canyon, I don't know why it says C-N-Y-N, but, but, um, but Lion Canyon in Santa Barbara goes from our population here, the Santa Barbara Ventura population, flies all the way up the coast to Big Sur, hangs out up there for a while, and then flies back. So that's super critical because that tells us we have connectivity between these two populations, right? So if something, if we can have gene flow, we can have, if something goes wrong with one, theoretically, our, our birds from you know, area A can get to area B and, and, and repopulate area B. So that's really, really key. Okay, let's talk about experimental uh, population designation, then we'll take a little, maybe a little break here in a sec. Um, so this is a key thing. Remember, under, under the Endangered Species Act, when something is a threatened or endangered species, we cannot take it. Take in the generic sense of the take, meaning obviously you can't take it, you can't kill it, but you also cannot do anything that, that harasses the bird. You can't change its behavior. You can't scare it. You can't make it leave its nest. All of those things are considered, in the legal sense, a taking. Okay, so, right? You can imagine the Endangered Species Act, which passes almost unanimously in 1973, which is crazy. I just want to reemphasize that. In the Nixon era, this Endangered Species Act passes with very little pushback. Bipartisan, rural, urban, everybody's like, yeah, let's do this, right? It quickly becomes, wait, you want to do what? And then, you know, the whole story there, as you guys have, have read some of. Um, but basically, by this point, by the 80s, people are like, yeah, I don't want an endangered species on my property, right? If I have an endangered species on my property and I drive my truck down the road and it, and it flies away, that could be considered a taking. I just don't want it. I don't want it to have anything to do with it, right? So one of the innovations is this so-called uh, Section 10J part of the revision to the Endangered Species Act in 1982, which allows the federal agency that's overseeing the recovery of the species to designate an experimental population. What is that? That is a population that is spatially disjunct, is geographically disjunct from the, therefore we call it the non-experimental population. So we, we, we talk about the core thing, right? So if it's spatially disjunct and it's totally different, that can allow us to have other rules for the experimental population, right? So we can get into agreement. Hey, Mr. Farmer, can I, have, can I put an endangered species on your, on your farm? No way! Okay, here's the deal. If you drive by and you scare it and he falls over down and dies, you won't be fined. Oh, really? Maybe I'll let that happen, right? So the experimental population is a way to give us more flexibility, right? So we don't do that for the last birds, but as we're trying to expand it, we want to work with the landowners, work with the community, and make sure that they, don't, they see this as a good thing. They don't see this as a liability. And something they'll walk out in the middle of the night and shoot the bird in the head where nobody's looking. So, oh, the bird died, right? So we want to avoid all that, right? We want to go together down this path. And so the experimental population is one way to do that. And so because we're establishing this population in, in California, right, we, that's why we said, okay, these, these other place way far away on the other side of the Mojave Desert and everything, we're going to call these experimental populations. Um, and uh, uh, it just, it gives us more flexibility, it gives us a lot more flexibility. And, um, and there's so-called essential experimental populations, non-essential. I don't know what ex essential experimental populations are. I've never found one. All the ones that we use are, are non-essential and we use them a lot now. We use them for all these iconic critters, grizzly bears, uh, gray wolves, et cetera. Um, many of these organisms utilize this experimental population designation to help their recovery. Um, and that includes things like the whooping crane, like a you know, huge iconic critter that's flying all across the, you know, much of North America. Um, and so what, what we determined from, from banding studies is that the guys over here go over here in this, in this band, right, up to the Great Lakes. The guys over here in uh, coastal Texas go up to another part of Canada. And so that allows us to, for example, establish an experimental population of whooping cranes. So this, this technique that, that's, first, uh, that's first applied rapidly gets used across all different uh, endangered species uh, situations. 
Um, and, and while this is, the gray wolves have been updated since this happened, but we did the same thing with gray wolves. And that was essential to getting gray wolf populations established across, new populations established across the West. Um, this is what the experimental, popula uh, experimental population area uh, is in um, Arizona. And essentially, it is the Grand Canyon. So the, the, the whole of the Grand Canyon National Park and a bit, a bit outside of it is, um, is an experimental population for condors right now. So uh, a success story, a success story, a success story. So here you go. So this is the first, this is the first few years. I'll show you the, 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 the longer term data set in a second. But this is the first few years that I've broken down based on the type of birds and stuff for you. So basically, um, uh, there's, there's sort of two times they census. They census July 1, and, they, and then they'll generate reports uh, at the end of December. But this is basically July 1. Why July 1? It's a convenient time. There's nothing magic about July 1, but that's just a date so that we can uh, have everybody count as of that point in the different areas uh, and with the different geographies and different jurisdictions. So um, uh, here are the data for our California populations, our Arizona experimental populations, and then recently um, we've been introducing them in Baja, which is great. Um, all to their histor all places where they historically existed. Um, and so what you see here is the first little number on the left, those are the wild birds. And as I mentioned, um, we capture the last wild birds, so they go uh, ecologically extinct, functionally extinct in the wild. And then we have this you know, several year period where we're working on raising the babies, figuring out the methods, how are we going to do this, all, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then we begin to reintroduce them. So initially, all we have, as you can see, all we have are orange bars, right? We started this in California. Um, and, and so initially, the release just means a bird that was born in captivity that's now flying around out in, in nature. And as we mentioned, it takes about six years, you know, at least six years for these birds to reach sexual maturity. And also, you know, just because you hit sexual maturity doesn't mean you're super proficient at, at reproducing and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and so it takes a little bit of time. And so, so we see there's, there's about a decade or so there. And then we start to see this first little uh, burp, which is that light purple. So that light purple is an egg is laid and a baby hatches out of that egg and, and is seen in the nest. So we know that, that, that an individual has survived the reproduction, the egg stage, and is now into the, the baby stage. Um, but as you notice, there's, there's, it's just that light purple for the first couple years, or none. Um, and it takes a few more years for us actually to start to get the first fledglings. So fledglings are birds that are born in the wild, survive in the wild, and reach, you know, and leave the nest and go on to be an adult in the wild. That's what we want, right? We want that to be going on. We're still, this whole time, we're still making babies in San Diego Zoo and all the captivity. We're still trying to augment the population. But the goal is to get these populations to be self-sustaining so that we don't have to do all of this work to to, uh, you know, get them to be reared. Um, okay, so, so, that, so, so, you know, that's good. So, so by the mid, early two, 2000s, we're getting babies being born, not just in California, but also in, uh, also in Arizona, excuse me. <clears throat> this, is, this is a success story. So this, this is the overall, this is just wild. There's about another 200 or so birds in captivity, but there's, but there's, this is the wild populations. This is what we're trying to recover, right? So we've gone from 21 when we started this last round of grab everybody from the wild, and you see the red number drop down, and then we got the last one in 1986, and then, uh, and then we have this period, and so the green are all of our re-released wild birds. So now, as of 1995, as of 1995, we have condors again back in the wild. So they are no longer extinct in the wild. If you're a bird nerd, are they here a big birder? No birders here? So if you're a bird nerd, you might think, hey, there's birds out in the wild right here. But how the bird nerds play it, they only like to count birds that are naturally occurring birds. So if we, captured, if we raise a baby in captivity and let it go, and they see that, they don't count that as a wild bird. So they'll only count these purple, these maroon, dark maroon things as quote unquote eligible for a birder to see as a, as a true wild 
uh, population. Um, so basically, we're going up here, and essentially, there's a, there's some burps, there's some there's some hiccups, there's some wildfires, there's some there's some droughts and things. But generally speaking, look at that recover, look at that slope. That slope is pretty dang consistent. That's great. So that's both us continuing to add individuals to the wild population and the wild population starting to, you know, recede itself. So that's awesome. This is a, this is a really, really cool uh, figure. The most recent data I have is 19, it's 2021. It takes about a year or so to get everything compiled and double checked and all that kind of stuff. And so, so basically, um, this is the most recent data we have, most updated data we have as of uh, uh, early 2023. No, this is, this, is, this is across, this is, so this is the entire, this is all the condors in the world, all the California condors in the world. So uh, Eddie's question was, is that in California? Here's the answer for California. So we have 334 birds in the wild, 91 are in central California, so are near Big Sur. If you guys come with me on our coastal trip, you will, uh, you'll maybe see some of them. Uh, Southern California, so this is our Santa Barbara Ventura population. There's 92 birds here. Um, in the southwest, which is our Arizona experimental population, there's 111. In Baja, there's now 40 birds. And really, really cool, we, we're just in the process of starting to reintroduce some birds up in the Pacific Northwest. The Yurok tribe has been working on this for some time, and they, they just took their first four birds up there um, a few months ago. Um, and so uh, birds from, from down south here in California. In captivity, uh, as, of, as of December of 2021, we had 203 uh, birds in, in various cap. And see, these are all the different programs that are involved in the captive breeding program. So they have one or more uh, California condors in their, in their facilities. Um, and as of, as of December of 2021, we had a total of um, 43 breeding pairs. We had um, uh, 40 chicks that had hatched that were, you know, getting ready to, you know, starting to grow. And then we had 35 birds that were going to be released uh, in 2022. So, you know, holding off until the release season, after the rainy season and stuff like that. Um, and so the big success story here is, is these birds um, are about 20 times the number that existed back when we, we started this, you know, back when we started the captive breeding program. So that's a huge success. Somebody had a question. Oh yeah, Eddie. Uh, what point are they gonna stop breeding them and consider them like stable? Great the question. So when do we stop this? When do we say that they're recovered? Great question. Um, it's almost like I had, it's almost like I planted Eddie to say that, but I didn't, I didn't. I didn't actually have to say that. So, but great question. Uh, so, uh, you, see, you see how well I laid this lecture out that you guys are like, well, hey, what about blah, blah, blah. And then I look super smart like smart professor dude. But, oh, let me, let me show you, Eddie. Here's the answer to your question. Um, so, okay, so this is the most recent recovery plan, the one we're using now. Um, I think there's one, we're working on one. It, it, so, so you have a recovery plan, then every so often you update it. But I, we're in the process of updating. I, have, I don't think I've seen the most recent one. So this is, this is the, the guidance from, the, la, from the, the main one that we've been using. To be recovered, in other words, to start, start delisting them, to downgrade them uh, uh, from endangered to threatened, and then to eventually from threatened to, to non-threatened, which is what we all want. That's the whole goal of the Endangered Species Act. The Endangered Species Act's goal is not to keep things on the list. The goal is to get things off, to get them recovered, so we don't have to be careful around them and all that kind of stuff. So that we need more, at least two non-captive um, populations so that could be California and Arizona. That could be um, that could be Pacific Northwest in California, whatever, right? But at least two, and at least one captive population. So we want to keep this captive population going in case something happens—a disease outbreak, something of that nature. Okay. Uh, so in that part, we got that. We have that now, right? So already right now, we have two two uh, non-captive populations and one captive population. Great. Next, okay, the next test is each of these populations has to have at least 150 birds in it, in each one, okay? And there has to also be at least 15 breeding pairs. Remember we said they're monogamous, so they, they, they mate for life. So we have to make sure there's at least 15 moms and dads 
pairs out there um, making babies. And the, the trajectory, the monitoring over, over time has to show that the number of birds there are enough to meet whatever, the weather, the disease, the, the crazy rancher shooting them, whatever, whatever the, the death rate is, that we're making enough babies so that they can, they can be self-sustaining and uh, actually expanding. And so it doesn't have to be super high, but it has to at least be positive over, over a few years. Um, and then, hold on a second, and then, and then the last one is the wild populations also, so those non-captive ones, they have to be physically separated from one another. So if we have something like a Thomas fire or something, it can't, can't take them all out in one fell swoop. Um, and the fact, and, and, the, and this is also important, non-interacting. The fact that I said that one bird flew from Santa Barbara to Ventana and back, that's awesome from a conservation standpoint. From this perspective, that means that those two populations are interacting. So we just have to, we can only consider those as one population, not two. Hence, why we're trying to start them in Baja, why we're trying to start them in Arizona, why we're trying to start them in Pacific Northwest, that they're really physically apart. So if a disease breaks out somewhere, the disease doesn't spread to everybody, is the idea. Um, and, then, and then we have to, and then somewhere in all these wild populations, we have to have the genotypes of all the founding uh, the, the, when we pulled those, the last of the wild guys into captivity and held them there, we have to have those genes represented in all the wild populations. Caleb had a question. Uh, yeah. So the question is, how do we know the death rate? Because we have a very, very active monitoring of these critters. Okay. So all the birds are tagged. They're not all, necess they're not all necessarily radio collar tagged, but they're all, they all have wing tags. And so there's their very active monitoring programs here where people go out, not only do they check the GPS signals in the, in the satellite locations, but they're also physically looking at them. When the moms and dads are, are nesting, they're going up and they're, they're observing the nest and they're saying, can I see an egg? So there's, it's, a, it's a very, very um, aggressive, aggressive is that the right word? But it's a very thorough monitoring, I should say, which we don't always have in many of our endangered species. So we have, we have a good sense. Um, now, if maybe a bird left and flew to Bakersfield, um, and wasn't radio collar, or the radio collar died. We don't necessarily uh, have every single corpse that died, but we definitely know that it's it's left the the immediate area, kind of thing. Like the yes, good question. So we'll get to that. So so they are. So what I'm showing you is the total. What I. So Caleb's question is, how do we know how many die? This is how many individuals are alive each year, right? So this is a balance between some some individuals die every year. So this is a balance between the additions and the subtractions. And so we'll, we'll, we'll get to the question about death, and, and let's talk about death in a second. Um, but here's just a couple fun pictures. So this is the first example of a condor in Northern California. This, is, uh, this was a, a burned out a redwood, a tr a tr a hollow of a redwood tree in 2006. And this is in Monterey County. This was, this was really cool. So um, again, uh, we had no evidence. They were, they were just restricted down here in Ventura County, et cetera. And here's our first um, condor back in Mexico uh, since the 1930s. This is, this is in 2009, super, super cool. Um, and here's some of our uh, Mexican colleagues uh, uh, checking out the, the, the juvenile there. Um, I, I showed you this video. We started the, the lecture out with this video, but, but this is the Thomas fire. There was huge worry that this big massive fire might nuke these guys. They survived okay, which is awesome. Um, and as I mentioned before, what just happened, what just happened um, uh, last year was the Yurok tribe brought the first uh, four California birds up to the Pacific Northwest, up to Redwood um, National Park, and um, are, are working on getting ready to release those birds up there, right? And so, the cool, so that's cool on many levels. It's another population, et cetera. Also, this is being done by the tribe, right? So this is not a federal agency. So, so we have state agencies, federal agencies. In the case of Big Sur, it's a, it's a, it's a nonprofit. It's an environmental advocacy group, right? Conservation organization. So we have pro private folks doing that. Also, the Peregrine Falcon and uh, Peregrine Fund is also a nonprofit. Um, but then now we also have native um, communities doing this themselves, right? Like, you know, th they're in charge of it. They're running it. They hire their own staff. They have their own people. So very cool that we have all these different communities working on this and bringing their different expertise uh, in. 
uh, okay, so captive breeding works. It's great, but it has some challenges, right? So we can become too reliant on captive breeding, right? We want these populations to be doing on their own, and sometimes we might become so um, over-dependent on this help that they might, you, know, you can imagine they might become lazy, so that's a challenge. Um, the reintroduction methods are something we always got to be constantly working on. It's tempting to just say, ah, oh, we know how to do it, we'll just stop. But there might always be improvements. So, so, we're, we're, um, so first, figuring that out in the first place is a huge challenge. But also, is there a more optimal method um, is also a challenge. Um, again, we mentioned before that worry about imprinting and, and having the birds be too, um, too, associate, too friendly with people. We're really worried about that. Um, disease, another huge issue. What if, what if we have a disease outbreak and, and we have such a small population they could be hit? Either they could lack the, because of the genetic bottlenecking, they could lack the diversity to respond to that disease, or because they're relatively small but spatially aggregated, that disease could spread really quickly through the population. Resources, resources, resources. I ask everybody about this. How much have we spent on condor recovery? Nobody can tell me. Nobody knows. It's, there's private funds, there's federal funds, there's state funds. It's, it's, it's tens and tens and tens and tens, if not hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, right? So this is an expensive endeavor. Um, and not just expensive endeavor in terms of money, it takes a lot of people's time, right? We need experts that know how to do rock climbing, they can go count birds, and it's, 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 it's special skill sets. A real huge challenge with bureaucratic continuity. We started this in the, in the 70s. We started go, going really hard in the 80s. We started doing releases in the 90s. We started expanding the releases in the early 2000s. We're doing, right, so you gotta have that consistency from program to program to program. And when you have um, different administrations or whoever come in, that can be a problem, right? We're talking decadal long planning here to, for the recovery of the species. And then, of course, we have the environment's changing on us. It's not the same environment as it was in the 1930s or 1800s, right? So we have that constant challenge as well. Um, so here are, so uh, Caleb was asking about like w these guys dying, how many die, all this, uh, you know, what's going on here. So here's, here are the deaths from 1992 to 2012. So in this case, in this, this sample data set, there was 123 deaths over that period of condors. And, uh, so, and so here's the answer. So it's in California, Arizona, and Baja. So those are the different colors there. On the x-axis are the different sources of mortality. So what's the biggest source of, of mortality for these guys? Lead. Lead, 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 lead. So the power lines have mostly been solved by, by some, um, essentially, uh, 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 some structures we can put on the power lines, because again, these birds are really, really large. They're the largest bird wingspan in North America. So normally what happens is when bird, birds land on these wires, they kind of go like this, ha ha, and they spread their wings, and they, and they close the circuit, and they get electrocuted, right? Bad for the birds, bad for the power lines. But, but in most cases, we're not worried about a condor, right? We're worried about a vulture or a hawk, which is maybe you know, this you know, you know, arm's length, whereas these big, large adult vultures, they're much larger, unlike pretty much anything else. So, so the power line spacing that you do in Florida might be fine in Florida, but here it wouldn't be enough. So, so the power line is one thing that we've addressed and is, and is getting fixed, but you see other things like microplastics and everything, but lead is the big story here. So in this study, uh, um, up to the, with this 2012 data set, 20% of the condors had lead levels. So we, we, we capture them, we, we take a sample of their blood and we do blood tests. 20% of them had blood lead levels that were high enough to require chelation treatment. So chelation treatment is kind of like what Gwyneth Paltrow would sell you, to tell you it's the greatest thing in the world or some kind of crap. But basically, you sit down and you suck the blood out of the, has anybody donated white blood cells, platelets? No, nobody's donated platelets, okay. Uh, so does anybody donate blood? Yeah. Okay, so we donate blood, they just go, they suck the blood out, they go, thanks, right? With platelets, <laughs> what they're doing is they're trying to take something out of your bloodstream, right? In this case, the, the white blood cells. 
So you sit down and it's not like a regular, like you donate blood, it takes like five minutes and they give you a cookie and like, hey, don't crash on the way home and that's it, right? <laughs> Platelet donation is you, it takes like two, three hours. They, they give, a, give you a movie to watch, right? Because they sit down and they, they put a, a needle in this arm and a needle in this arm. And so, so the blood goes out, goes through a machine that separates out the platelets, and then it puts the rest of the blood back in your body, right? And so that's essentially what we do with these condors. We're essentially sucking the blood out and then, and then using a chelation treatment, which takes the lead from a biologically available form of the lead into a, a non-biologically available form of lead and then filter out the lead, basically. Or, or allow the bird to pass, pass the lead out through um, uh, the kidneys and stuff. Where are they getting all the lead from again? Great question. So the question is, where is the lead coming from? So, so I, but let me also just say, so, so, so that was old data. So here, here's newer data. So this is the most recent data we have, which is up to, up to 2020. Half of all the mortality now, so again, this, this is up to 2012. So we're about a, about a decade more of data now. Half of all the known sources of mortality um, had, if they weren't directly caused by the lead poisoning, the lead poisoning made them very sick. So they, they had a whole lot of lead toxosis, right? We also had, so that, that's, that's 107 birds in that, in that new thing. There were 106 birds that we couldn't, that we, that we, we lost them. Like I said, they flew away. We didn't know where they went. So we, didn't, we weren't able to do a real autopsy on those. So I guarantee at least a good chunk of those 106 also died from lead poisoning. So we're talking about way more than half of the mortality, probably maybe close to like two thirds, right? Or maybe even 75% of the mortality is coming from lead. And the question is, where is the lead coming from? So here you go. Here's a hint. Here's a hint. So here are different months of the year. Here is the number of birds we sampled there. And then this is the blood lead level, okay? Blood lead level. So, so the, there's the mean, the minimum, and the max. So uh, do you guys see any pattern to this? September to October is high. So, okay, so, okay, so, okay, so September, October seems particularly high. Uh, oh, good question. No, we're not burning coal. Good, good guess. There's something else that's going on in fall. I, I know the answer, but it's around like hunting season. Hunting season! Yes, that's what a lot of people are out there hunting deer and stuff. So hunting season. Did you have another question, Izzy? Uh, I did, but I'll wait till you. Okay. Oh, wait till I do my cool, I reveal or whatever. That is. Okay, so, so basically it's coming from bullets not shot at the bird, bullets shot at other wildlife that are left out in the field. What do, what do condors do? They eat dead stuff, right? I shoot, I shoot, my, I shoot my deer. Um, I just did a race this weekend where I had to carry all this heavy weight around these hills up in Santa Clarita and my shoulders still hurt and it sucked. I don't like carrying weight on my shoulders, especially like sweating in the heat with people like going, go faster, go faster, right? So if I was out hunting, I'd want to carry the lightest load on my shoulders. So when I kill that deer, I'm going to first gut it and leave the, the guts, the innards, the parts that we don't eat there. Because I don't want to carry that. I don't, want to, I don't want to carry that all the way back to the trailhead, back to my car, back to my whatever, right? So I'm going to leave that pile of what we call offal with an O, offal O. -F -F. Those bullets, are the lead is still in there. And so now our birds, our condors, hey, rah, 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 and they start eating that, those guts, which is great food for them, but, that, but they're ingesting this lead as they're, as they're feeding on these carcasses of these, these shot uh, individuals. So, okay, story of lead. We've been using lead for a long time in our society. We've been using it uh, since the Bronze Age. It's a very shapeable metal, so it's very easy to, to put into different um, uh, shapes and also to make you know, art with, et cetera. Um, the ancient Romans and Egyptians used it in their, in their water distribution systems. And, uh, and there's a popular theory that says that's one of the things that helped the Roman Empire fall. It was the poisoning that, they were, that, they were so, that was so ubiquitous um, in them. Um, for us, it's lead shot and lead bullets. 
That was first developed when we invented, when the, in the wake of the Chinese inventing gunpowder, and we then initially applied gunpowder for fireworks, and then when we start to use it for weapons, we start to do projectiles, and lead becomes a popular projectile, especially starting in the 14th century. So now lead deforms. So what does that mean? That means it kills people better. So when the bullet hits something, it's going to hit my tissues, my gut, my rib, my whatever, and it's going to, yeah, right, it's going to, it's going to, poof, it's going to, it's going to like make a bunch of different small pieces and damage me more than just a solid, you know, like a, like say a pure, I don't know, tungsten sphere or something, right? So we actively use lead because it is more deadly and it breaks up into smaller pieces and stuff. Um, we've known it's toxic to people for a long time. We don't believe there's any safe level of lead. So some things like, oh, below this level is probably not big. There doesn't appear to be a safe level of lead. Even the smallest, smallest concentrations can cause neurological problems, et cetera. Um, yeah, okay. All right, so we started banning lead in the US, right? So our pollution management stuff, we started banning lead. Um, we first, uh, we, so we banned lead-based paints in 1977. Um, still old buildings like campus here one of the reasons you're not allowed to go into the old um, spaces um, uh, is because there's asbestos there and there's lead paint. And so before we put a new classroom in those spaces, we have to first what's called abate that space. We have to get the, all the lead paint off the walls, get all the asbestos off the stuff, and then, then we can start to renovate. And then we can start. So that's why it's, it's relatively costly to expand uh, buildings here on campus. Um, in the 1980s, we phased it out of gasoline. It was added because some of the way the engines were running in the 50s, they would so-called knock. They go tuk 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 tuk, and people are like, oh, that sucks. Let's add a big poison in the, into that tank, and then let's poison the planet. That's a much better solution. So now we're like, so we got it out. So now, now all the gasoline you guys buy is unleaded. And if you had some ancient historic car that you wanted to run on special, you have to buy a special liquid thing of lead to pour it in, and it's, it's very expensive, and you pretty much wouldn't want to do that usually ever. Um, okay, um, we then start to see bans in the early 90s of hunters using lead in certain sensitive areas. Again, wetlands, super important here in terms of conservation history, and it starts with waterfowl. Um, and then in 95, we ban it as a soldering medium for uh, cans. It is super toxic. So, um, so we've known it's been toxic to people for a long time, but our, our understanding of lead toxicity in wildlife is, is a bit newer. Um, we first really start to see some evidence of this in the late 1800s in the Gulf Coast. Um, and uh, we get the first real modern treatise on this in the late 50s. And we now understand that one of the reasons why bald eagles were having a problem were not, was not just EDT, but it was secondary lead ingestion because they eat a lot of um, uh, uh, they're also scavengers, basically. Um, and so, yeah, okay, so this is what we're looking like. So this is animals shot in California, hunt by hunters, in 2000. And check it out. So, so this is, so the, the, each of the bars is over the different county, which is the reporting district for the, for the state. And what you see is uh, there's a lot of rabbits and tree squirrels uh, in Kern County. There's a lot of rabbits and tree squirrels in Los Angeles, um, et cetera. There's wild pig, which would, pig would be something that, um, you know, there's, they're gonna leave a lot of biomass behind. Also deer, a lot of biomass. And check it out, these, county, these, these areas are that old classic horseshoe of the core, historic core distribution of where condors were. And here are military bases. So our military bases do a lot of shooting um, so, for example, out here at Magoo, we have our own shooting range, which the, the CBs use, the sheriff, et cetera. In many of these shooting ranges, this sounds crazy, but it's true. In many of these shooting ranges, the lead by the targets is at mineable concentrations. So it's like a vein of lead running through the ground. There is so much lead that's accumulated over time there because so many bullets have, have gone hit the target right there. Izzy. Good question, good question. Um, and we're not entirely sure. 
but, but it's probably just a numbers thing. So right here, so in this, in, to, in the year 2000, we shot 91,000, in, in this area where I'm talking about, we shot 91,000 animals, and that's gonna translate into something like 47,000 carcasses, or at least large chunks of the animals left outside. So even if we did a good job of having that, or taking that down to a quarter, that's still, there's still a, still a large chunk of individuals out there. And this is an x-ray of a condor. So we're looking at, the, the, here's, here's a wing, here's his belly, here's his, his um, vertebral column, and that thing right there, that's a piece of lead shot in his, in his gut. Um, so uh, we start, so then the campaign, the next conservation management thing to recover these species was, hey, let's use, let's use um, other, uh, you know, we don't want to stop hunting, but let's use something other than lead for the projectiles, right? And so, so this was a big thing. And so uh, we want to get hunters to, to buy into this, right? So uh, we started doing some surveys. And so this was a survey in 2006 to ask hunters what they thought about it. Um, and essentially, we gave hunter, hunters some free ammunition and said, try this out and tell me what you think about it, right? So this is... Same size bullets, works in their same guns or same rifles, whatever the heck. It's just, it's just not the, the, the thing that flies in the air isn't made out of lead. And so 60% of them said it was either excellent or above average, uh, which is good, right? So in other words, the majority of people said, hey, this is good. This is shooting more accurate or, or shooting better or whatever that, than, than I, I thought again. And most would say they would use lead again, but they didn't want to pay for it, okay? So they would totally do it again if you gave it to me, or if I could swap out my lead bullets for you, I would totally do that. And 75% and of, of these folks said they would recommend the non-lead ammunition to their, to their friends if they were asking, hey, what should, I, what should I buy at the store this weekend or whatever? And so this drove a huge effort, which we're still in, to start to, to augment, to make it, to, to take out the extra, and, and when we started this, it was about four times the, the cost of, the non-lead ammunition was about four times the price of, of the regular buckshot or the, or the other bullets on average. And so, um, so yeah, right, okay, cool. So lead is still an abandoned bullet. Oh, we're getting there, it is. Now it is, for us it is. Okay, so, well not bullets, but for hunting. So not bullets, hunting stuff, right? So you can still buy it, but you're not allowed to go out and shoot a duck or something with it. Okay, so, so, then, the, so then we have this um, uh, uh, Ridley Tree Conservation Act that initially bans the use of lead ammunition just in the historic horseshoe area in California. Okay, this is, this is a state law, it's California law. Hey, don't use lead in this area. And we do that for a bit. Um, and, and then we start to get this huge pushback. So this is one example. Going to cancel billions and billions of dollars in payments to the United Nations climate change programs and use the money to fix America's environmental infrastructure. Suffice it to say, Donald Trump is not a big believer in man-made climate change, contrary to the views and data of the vast majority of scientists. Our plan will end the EPA, which is a, hey look, it's all wonderful, but it's a disaster. That's why the former EPA administrators under Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, and George H.W. Bush hammered Trump during the election for pledging to yank the U.S. from the Paris Accords, an international agreement to fight climate change, a move they said, quote, would set the world back decades. My name is Myron E. Bell, and I'm... Leading the Trump transition team on environmental matters is an avid climate change denier, a man who was once funded by the tobacco industry to fight those seeking to further regulate cigarettes. Myron Ebel is the director of the Center for Energy and Environment, part of a libertarian think tank that, quote, questions global warming alarmism, partly funded by some of the same industries such as coal that are being heard by regulations of the fossil fuel industry. Ebel has long fought against environmental regulations, arguing they're an extension of government power. As he told PBS in 2012, he rejects the reams of data and evidence suggesting that man-made climate change is real. We believed that the so-called Global warming consensus was not based on science, but was a political consensus. That's rejecting evidence accepted by most scientists. Okay, enough of that drivel. But you guys get the idea, right? So, uh, so the idea is um, we've had pushback, significant pushback on all types of pollution regulations, not just bullets. 
but all manners of stuff. So if you guys go in the next room, you'll see a, a painting that one of my students did when we went to New Orleans in the wake of this. Massive flares because uh, in this case, the Trump administration uh, essentially got rid of some emission standards. So this power plant, or this, uh, excuse me, chemical refinery, petroleum refinery, was allowed to just put all this stuff in the air. And so similar things have been going on. So there's pushback with all this stuff. Nevertheless, we've persisted, the state of California has persisted, and we've, so this is, for example, Fish and Game. This is initially uh, when we were still in this first phase where it was, hey, which county are you in? Click on this website. You can find out if you're allowed to use lead ammunition or not, et cetera. Long story short, we've been expanding this. And now we are uh, statewide. And so now we, um, we, we, it's been phases, but now as of, as of 2019, we have this uh, uh, full, full state. You have to use non-lead for any type of hunting in the state of California. So Izzy's question is, why haven't we seen a strong effect? It's only really fully gone into effect just relatively recently. Also, there's the question of how do we police this, right? Cheap lead, you can still buy, you can still buy the ammunition, you just can't quote unquote hunt with it, so you could take it to a target range or something. You know, so yes, there are rangers, and some of our students are game wardens, and they check, and, but, but there's only so many folks, right? And much of this hunting is taking place, by definition, away from cities and things of that nature. So it's, so it's a little bit hard to police. Izzy. Are lead bullets cheaper? Can you make your own Yes, bullets? yes, yes. It's, it's, so they're, I don't know the current price, but when we first started this, uh, the, the non-leaded ammunition, as I said, on average was about four times uh, the cost. It's, 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 I would say in the grand scheme of things, it's still not, a, not massively expensive, but, but it, it does, but you know, I don't want to trivialize folks that don't have a whole lot of money and four times is four times, right? Um, so what groups, so the focus has been really on trying to make it as easy as possible for people, especially in and around Condor territory, to make sure they use, so we, we saw when given the choice, hunters prefer the non-leaded stuff, right? It shoots more accurately, all this and that. They're just balking at the cost primarily, right? And then there's some people that balk at like, you're, a gov you're the government, you can't tell me what to do. But, but for the most part, Again, most hunters are very concerned with conservation. They want to see more condors. They want to see more wildlife. They're not, they're not an enemy of conservation by any means. Um, but it's an issue of cost. And so what, pro, what groups like Ventana have done and groups in Arizona and elsewhere is just done free giveaways. So you, you buy your, you buy your uh, leaded bullets, and then I'm going to give you a one-for-one -one swap. So I got a box of ammunition here. You give me your dirty lead and I'll give you a, a clean bullet kind of, kind of idea so that hunters, um, at least in the, uh, this isn't statewide, but this is in the areas where we have the condor populations, that at least we can hope, hopefully start to minimize that. And they've given out, as of this morning, at their website said they've given out uh, a little bit less than 13,000 boxes of ammunition just in their sort of Big Sur uh, area. That is a lot, that is a lot. And so these are all the places, that, so, so we are in the area they give it out in, Although I think they're doing most of that up in the Big Sur area, but, but you guys get the idea. Okay, then just one last one to, to finish up here. Uh, one last little, little topic is, um, so uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, Professor Spees gave, gave you guys a, a guest lecture because I was at that toxicology conference. This was a poster at one of those toxicology conferences. And uh, so our colleagues um, uh, at uh, uh, Cal Poly Pomona are doing some great work. They're trying to figure out why are turkey vultures not dying of all this lead poisoning? They do die of lead poisoning, but not at the same numbers as our condors. And so we don't know yet. They're, so they're just starting the study, but the suspicion is that um, there's something about the, the digestive tract, et cetera, of the, and the physiology of the turkey vultures that they're used to eating more diverse things over their evolutionary history, and so they have maybe more ability to resist some of this toxic crap in their bloodstream in, or in their digestive tract. So don't know if that's true or not, but they're starting to look at that. But it's, it is definitely clear that we don't see the same proportion of turkey vultures die as our condors. It might be because the turkey vultures are, are eating a different prey base, but they're still out there, and there's so many carcasses, you'd think that there would be some element of that. 
It could be. It, yeah, yeah, there may be a bigger animal so they can ingest more in one sitting and then get more. So that's possible too, yeah. We don't know. I'll just say that this is an active area of research. Cool. Okay, so, uh, so recovery is still an uphill battle. So again, conservation success story, but we're still trying to figure stuff out. So here is, uh, uh, we talked about tule elks. Here is an example of, uh, although I think this was Roosevelt elks, this particular story, but uh, last November, um, uh, these guys were poaching, illegally hunting elks, and turns out they were using leaded bullets to do that. So here they're both taking out our, one of our species of concern and posing a risk to another species of concern. This is up in the, up in the um, near, near Eureka, up in Northern California. And then uh, just this January, uh, one of our, our bird number uh, 698 died from lead uh, exposure. So um, uh, a young, a th young three-year-old bird um, this is in like the San Luis Obispo area, basically. Um, and uh, another big, huge one that just came out a couple uh, last week was um, we now have confirmation that avian flu, bird flu, that's spreading around the U.S. And you've, you've experienced this if you try to buy eggs lately, and the price of eggs has skyrocketed because our chickens are getting hit by this, by this version of bird flu. We've had different versions in the past. Um, but it it's, it's broadly hits many different avian species. And we now have confirmation that the Arizona population has bird flu in it, that, that a bird tested positive for uh, bird flu. So another, you know, we always have to be worried about these diseases that could be coming, either historic diseases, novel, novel vectors, all that different kinds of stuff. So, so um, we're on a recovery. We're, we're, we're on a great trajectory. We're doing good, but we need to deal with this lead and some of these other things. So even though it seems like we've, we've come a long way, there's always additional challenges that, that pop up. So again, in summary, these guys were abundant before Europeans got here. Um, they were really abundant before humans got here, but, but the recent times they're abundant. Um, a very important scavenger, especially of large-bodied uh, critters. Um, messed up by habitat destruction, changed prey base, poisoning, active and or unintentional, active shooting, all that drove the population down very low. It was very low in the, in the um, you know, 50-ish, 60-ish birds, mid part of the century. They continue to decline. They've become a poster child of the conservation movement and of the possibility of conservation biology, that we know how to do stuff. If we have the resources and the time, we can recover these things, right? This thing that looked really iconic, seemed very difficult to work with. How do you do this? We figured it out, right? We figured it out with different communities, with different technologies, et cetera. It's a conservation success. We still have hurdles, so I don't want to be naive, but I want to leave with this. It is super awesome that we have 20 times more birds right now on planet Earth than we did in 1987 when we, we, when we removed the last, when the last individuals were no longer in the wild. That is awesome. And so I want you to remember this trajectory that we're on, right? We still need to do work with this lead and stuff to make sure this, this keeps this projection, but this is a great place to be right now, right? We're on the road to um, hopefully in the near future Recovery, right now, if the lead problem stays as strong as it is, it's going to be really hard to hit those targets. If we take care of the lead problem, there's a good chance we'll be able to hit those, those recovery targets very soon. All right, great. Questions? Any questions about any of that stuff? Yeah, Brian. Nada? Okay. Then let's take a quick uh, five-minute break.